bell rings, we welcome you to worship on this 10th Sunday after Pentecost. And the first thing I'll do is apologize for the Bible. The Bible. The bulletin. <laughs> Not the Bible. <laughs> the bulletin is a week off. It is the 6th of August today, and it is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. It's been a long week. And I welcome all of you to worship today. It's an exciting day because tonight begins Vacation Bible School here at the church. It's an ecumenical Vacation Bible School with several other churches helping. Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. Dinner at 5.30, the program will start here in the sanctuary at 6. Dinner will be served, or supper will be served from 5.30 to 6. Then we have crafts, recreation, Bible stories, snacks, everything you wanted in a vacation Bible school and more. The theme, the resurrection stories of Jesus. So we invite all of you who are here, and all of you who want to invite others, come and join us. We'll make do. Please note that prayer meeting happens by a Zoom on Wednesday mornings at 8. And Thursday, we join the Sharpsburg Church for a Bible study in Sharpsburg, 315, studying in both Genesis and John. It is our practice, as I welcome you all here today, that when someone is 90 years old and comes to church on their birthday, we sing. Heather, would you like to introduce your grandma? <laughs> yep, my grandma Grace, she's 91 today. 91 Grace is today. She's sitting over there with the singles. You can just wave. Uh, no, I, I'll just play my guitar. I didn't tell Becky ahead of time. It's been a bad week, I said, Becky. Here we go. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.
himself, and he prayed for their unity. Forgive our many divisions. Forgive our lack of charity toward people whose customs are different, or whose creeds conflict with what we claim to believe. Forgive our arrogance when we claim to know God's truth, forgetting that Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Forgive our sins and heal our divisions. We pray through Christ our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And He lived for us, died for us, rose for us, and intercedes for us even now. I declare to you the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. So as you are seated, turn to your neighbors and pass peace. Younger people, come on down for our children's message.
How was it a wrestling match? Well, you know what finally happened? The angel reached over with his powers, touched Jacob on the hip, and threw it out of socket. But Jacob still held on to him. He wanted a blessing. And so you know what the blessing was? Jacob got a new name. Israel. Hmm. And not only that, yes, Israel became the name of the whole nation. It's a place now, you're right. And Jacob's 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a long story. But in the wrestling with God, Jacob changed. And that's why he got a new name. By the way, how many of you have a middle name? When do you hear your middle name called? Like when you really mess up? Yes, from mom. Mm -hmm. And what does she say? You're not saying your middle name. There you go. That's right. But God calls us by a new name, too. That's what I want to tell you. Maybe in your life sometime, you'll end up wrestling with God. Wrestling about something when you're trying to figure out what's right, or who you should be hanging around with, or who you should marry. Maybe you'll wrestle with God. And maybe God will give you a new name. But you know what name God has already given to you all? Beloved. God calls you beloved. I put my guitar on my wrong side because I want to sing you a song called Beloved. Are you ready? It goes like this. Beloved, let us love one another. The love is of God and everyone who loves is born.
though we do have everything covered. Other joys and concerns besides Grace's 91st birthday today. Any joys or concerns? I understand that uh, Gail's husband, ex-husband, uh, was found guilty of all counts. We're so thankful. We are lifting up Gail Powell in our prayers. Her husband found guilty of starting a fire that nearly took her life. But it has been a joy now at the Sharpsburg Coffee to have Gail joining with us and seeming to get her life back on track. So we continue to pray for Gail in the days that come. Others today that need to be lifted up? You know, it's uh, been real nice having our daughter Gail uh, with us and uh, she will be returning to Japan this week, so we pray for her. No. You're going to Seattle and then to Japan. Seattle's halfway to Japan already. <laughs> we are delighted to have you here with us, Gail.
permit for mission today is a new operation headed up by our Sharpsburg church called Operation Bearer Hub. It's for troops who are shipped to Alaska in cold weather. Apparently when Levi Breach, a member of that church, was shipped to Alaska, it took him three weeks to issue his winter gear. It was 30 below with a 72 wind chill when he arrived. And so his parents have started with the help of other families of troops, a nonprofit called Operation Bearer Hub, in which they have purchased or are in the process of purchasing warm clothing that is military grade and passes their inspection, has to be bought there to be given out until they get their issue. Long underwear, socks, hats, gloves, and the like. They will be serving breakfast at the Steel and Spokes Auto Show Saturday here in our park from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Sharpsburg Church is covering all the costs of the breakfast. Some of it was donated. And so any contribution you give will go 100% to Operation Bearer Hub. Biscuits and gravy, scrambled eggs, French toast, fluids, coffee, juice, milk. I think that's what's being served. And our session graciously allowed that if they need to use our kitchen, they run on the food or eat something, they will come in early, use our kitchen, clean it up, and I'm in charge of making sure they do so. So that will happen early Saturday morning. So if you're interested, go by the car show. And even if you miss breakfast, they'll probably still have their jar out there collecting donations. Operation Bearer Hub. Let us receive our morning tithes and offerings.
they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. The second reading is from Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. The feeding of the 5,000. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat in a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus came ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed them and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowds, and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. There's an old saying in the preacher world, Preaching a text without context is pretext. Which literally means that those who preach on a text with no regard to what happens before and after the particular text might just be trying to cover up or hide something important to the understanding of the text. Or might be trying to use the text for their own ends. It's a bit of an overstatement, I believe, since the meaning of many biblical texts is perfectly clear without knowing what comes before or after. But with respect to today's two gospel readings, it is important to know what comes before. Our gospel text for this morning began, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. I hope when you heard those words, you were left wondering. What did Jesus hear that caused him to withdraw to a deserted place by himself? The answer is there in the text. He heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded in prison by King Herod. The news of John's death surely caused the fully human Jesus to grieve deeply. John was his cousin, his friend, not to mention the one who baptized him and prepared the way for his ministry. No doubt news of John's death likely caused Jesus both to mourn for John and to realize that he was headed in the same direction, down the path of suffering and death. And so Jesus withdrew by boat to a deserted place by himself, I assume, to reflect and pray and mourn for his friend and himself. But it was as true then as it is now. The world does not stop when we grieve. In fact, the 
world just goes on as if nothing has happened. The world did not pause to allow Jesus to grieve. For the people seeing him get into a boat went by foot ahead of them. And when he arrived, they were there waiting. My trip to the Holy Land helped me understand this passage better. You can see across the Sea of Galilee on a clear day. You can see every boat that's out on the sea. And so they watched where it was headed, beat him there on foot. It was a crowd full of people with many needs, including the need to be healed. Now, as I read this passage a little closer, you know what struck me? Almost always when Jesus was confronted with a crowd, he preached and then he healed. But there is no record in today's text of Jesus saying anything to the crowd. It left me wondering if perhaps he had no words. Grief can sometimes take away your words. The interim president of Southwestern Community College, Lindsay Stokes, is a member of our church. So I stopped by Swift this week to see how folks were holding up in the administration building. Lindsay was gone to Osceola for a meeting, but part of our Sharpsburg community, Kaisa Gordon, was there. She took me around. I could sense the grief. I asked her how things were, and she said, you know, we had the third vigil the other night, and folks must have run out of things to say, but were so deeply in grief, they couldn't share the words that they hoped to share because it was much shorter, much quieter than the first vigils. Grief can render you speechless, or perhaps grief makes you realize that sometimes words just aren't enough. Sometimes, when you're grieving, you can neither speak nor tolerate anyone else speaking. You need silence, or at least you need to be doing something. I talked with a woman this week who, when she was 12 years old, her mother died. And she shared with me that she coped with the death by playing non-stop solitaire. She said people were coming in and out of the house and speaking to me and offering their condolences, and I heard them all, but I just kept playing solitaire. It was what I had to do. Jesus, grieving John's death, handled his grief a bit differently. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion for them, and he healed their sick. You know, sometimes the best path to self-healing is to offer healing to others. I've been told by several sources that in the case of the three Southwest Community College students that died, all of them with Mount Air connections, their parents have been most comforted by one another and by the parents of a young woman in the accident still alive. In the midst of our grief, Followers of Christ are called to comfort one another, to show love and compassion that won't take away the suffering, but might make it more bearable. Sometimes words are not enough. Sometimes we need to act. In our second reading for today, the Apostle Paul never won to be short on words struggles to find words to convey his deep sorrow that so many of his fellow Jews have refused to accept the fact that Jesus was and is the Messiah that they were promised in their scriptures. If we'd had time to read the eight chapters of Romans that preceded, Paul makes a wonderful argument why 
God moved beyond the Jews to the Gentiles with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But just when he gets to the point where you think the Gentiles are who Paul is most concerned about, he stops and says, if I could be accursed and all of Israel be saved, I would gladly do so. His grief is present in that passage. He writes with great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart. I smile too, thinking of in the book of Acts. I can't tell you how many times, but I think it's three. Paul goes to a synagogue full of Jews and he preaches the gospel and a few accept, but most reject and they drive them out. And you know what Paul says? I'm never speaking to you Jews again. I'm going only to the Gentiles. And then he goes to the next town. He goes right back to the synagogue. Preaches to the Jews again. And they again reject him. Though some accept. And he says it again. I am through with you. I am going only to the Gentiles. And yet to the very end of his ministry. He keeps proclaiming the message. To the Jews. Because. Sometimes in the midst of our grief, our words can't be fully believed. We've all said those words in passion that we really didn't mean. I hate you. I wish that you were dead. I wish that we would just take a bomb and drop it on that country and obliterate them. Harsh words for a week in which we need to lift up our brothers and sisters in Japan, the anniversaries of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Sometimes our anger gets the best of us, but we need to look to Christ and follow his example. In my humble opinion, the reason Jesus didn't send the crowds away after he healed many who were sick is because he felt the need to show them God's love in a very concrete way. Jesus' disciples advised him to dismiss the crowd so they could go to a nearby village and buy food before the markets closed. It would also have given Jesus time to grieve and time for them to grieve. Because at least several of Jesus' disciples were followers of John. Before they were followers of Jesus, they too were grieving. Just send them away, Lord, so that we can grieve in peace, I imagine them saying. It's hard to blame them. But listen to what Jesus said. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. I like that. You give them something to eat. To which they say, oh, we don't have enough. All we have is five loaves and two fish. Are you ready for biblical math? Five plus two equals seven. The number of God, the number of perfection, the number of God's grace. There were seven loaves and fish, and Jesus blessed them and broke them, gave them to his disciples, and said, you give them something to eat. And they passed out the fish and the bread, and they were filled. Ready for some more biblical math? How many disciples were there? Twelve, just like there were twelve tribes of Jacob. How many disciples? carried a basket of leftovers, each of them, for there were 12 baskets filled with the leftover pieces. 12 is the number of sufficiency, the number of completion. There was enough for everyone. In fact, enough for the whole world, even the women and children. A strange way the gospel writers put it. There were 5,000 men 
not counting the women and the children. But Lord, help us if we didn't count the women and the children in our churches today, who would be there? Just a few men. But from the beginning of his ministry to the end, Jesus always counted the women and the children. And so do we. I close by inviting you to the table that has been prepared for you, for all who put their trust in Jesus Christ and their children. Come, share in this feast the gift of God's grace, for there is enough, not only for all of you, but for the whole world. Let us pray. Lord God, like Adam and Eve before us, we have fallen into sin. But at the right time, you came among us as Jesus Christ. You lived to show us how to live. You died for the sins of the world, and you were raised for our salvation. Send your Holy Spirit upon these common elements that they might represent for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, even as you consecrate these elements on the table, consecrate the elements that have been prepared in homes where people can take communion online. Lord God, receive these, the gifts of your people, and bless them. Through Christ we pray. Amen. With the elders serving on session, please come forward with Vera to help as our clerk. You may be seated. So I'll give you a heads up. Today, while we take communion, we are going to sing together. Let us break bread together on our knees. We'll sing the first verse while the bread is being passed out. Becky will continue to play, but we won't sing anymore. Until we all receive the bread, we will take it together. And then, as we pass out the wine, the juice, the cup, we will sing again the second and third verses of the hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together. We will pause then and take communion, the cup, together. A little different, but I thought we needed something different for our summer communion. The page number, Becky? 524, we're almost ready to sing. But watch and see, for on the night our Lord was betrayed, girls, he took bread, and he broke it, boys, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And in the same manner also, he took up the cup, and he poured, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you remember Jesus' death until he comes again. Elders, the body of Christ, gluten-free in the middle.
Just to let you know, my wife is fine. Keith Ferens, down at the Sharpsburg Church, our oldest member, 97 years old, had a family reunion and brought his family to church, and he asked Sandy if she would come down and play flute. And so Sandy came down and played for the Sharpsburg Church service today. Thank you to Becky. There's Becky. <laughs> for playing for a third Sunday in a row here. And I gave her a newish hymn. Let us talents and tongues employ for our closing hymn. Stand as we sing together 536.
As the bell rings, go forth into a world that's in need of your love, of the bread that Christ can give. Go in peace. Amen.